Welcome everyone to another episode of China is not our end. I want to thank the team, uh, Madison Tang and RJ Thompson for pulling this together so quickly. Um, we were watching mainstream media and hoping someone would talk about uh, what's happening in Afghanistan and relate it to China. Because the, you know, here's Afghanistan right next door to China and where right now there are bills going through Congress. They're about to come up for a vote. The continue funding the aggression on China, even as we witness this failed US state, the Pentagon power, the war machine, all of it unraveling and fully exposed for its violent, oppressive, destructive, the, the madness that it is, all happening with our taxpayer dollars um, and making the rich richer. So yet we don't hear anything about China. We don't hear anything about like, wow, we better not do that again. And so um, I reached out to VJ. This is happening a year after exactly VJ and I um, spoke on China's not our enemy, really just laying out this campaign with a webinar about why we needed to stop the aggression on China. And now we've seen Biden escalate the aggression on China. So it's so lovely to have VJ back. And for those of you who don't know, VJ Prashad is an Indian historian, journalist, commentator, and author of 30 books, including Washington Bullets, Red Star Over the Third World, the Darker Nations, a People's History of the Third World. He's also the chief correspondent for Globetrotter, a columnist for Frontline in India, chief editor of Left Word Books in New Delhi, and the executive director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. VJ seems to be available 24-7 to unmask the empire and expose the disastrous underworkings for those who are available to listen. So I want to thank all of you for being here and for what you do to learn the truth and share the truth. So Vijay, let's start with um, history. <laughs> Since you're a historian, <laughs> um, that seems to be totally missing from the conversation. And, and you did a really interesting piece this week for Frontline, um, taking us back a hundred years that I think Oh, Jody, you are muted. I don't know when I got muted, but when um, you said taking you back, <laughs> take us back to you know what? Let's go back and see what is Afghanistan. How has it been violated? Um, how do we distort what Afghanistan is? Because I think we're we're doing the same with China. But let's just look at Afghanistan and what we don't get to learn historically and bringing in the Orientalism that um, is part of what's happening here, both with Afghanistan and China. Well, it's great to be with you, Jody. You know, you are somebody I, I admire and respect enormously. And I think people need to know that at the time when um, this uh, really harsh war was, um, was placed on the Afghan people, imposed upon the Afghan people, Jody, Medea, Code Pink uh, went three times to Afghanistan, collected signatures of, from Afghan women. Uh, Jody personally delivered it to Barack Obama, President of the United States. You, you will also remember Barack Obama's condescending remark towards Medea, where he called her a young woman um, and so on. You know, uh, this is what one has to deal with from liberalism. Forget the hard right. I mean, when the liberals treat you in such a patriarchal way, uh, yeah. what do you expect from the hard right? But all salutes to Code Pink for an incredible 20 year period fighting against uh, militarism, particularly this harsh war against the Afghan people. And then, you know, even more so, if I could put it like that, the illegal war prosecuted against the Iraqi people. Um, two of the three wars that the United States has lost in this last period, the third Libya, the United States used its full military force against these three countries, um, Afghanistan, Iraq and Libya, and, and none of them was it able to um, get its war aims completed, unless you believe 
that the war aims of the United States government is to create chaos. I know there are some people who believe that those are the aims. If those are the aims, they succeeded. Although even here, I'm not sure, my friends, because I don't think they've created chaos in Iraq. The Iraqis are a resilient people, and they've decided to go in another direction, which is to create an entente with the Iranians, to attempt to have a reasonable relation with Syria and so on. So I don't even think they created chaos there. Um, and, I, and I'm not sure if chaos is the future of Afghanistan, a great country. Um, so, you know, uh, when the British were busy trying to take command of all of Asia, um, they went to an, a so-called opium war against the Chinese in the 1840s. And at the same time, at the same time, my friends invaded Afghanistan for the first time. They attempted the so-called first Afghan war at the same time as they were conducting the opium war against the Chinese. And they were defeated by the Afghans for complicated reasons. The reason they went into Afghanistan was to create a so-called buffer state between the British Empire, which was in, in greater India, uh, British India, and the Tsarist Empire. And so this war was there to essentially subordinate Afghanistan to, US, uh, to British ends. The British failed, and having failed, created two enduring myths, which I want to begin with. The first myth is that the Afghans are a barbaric people. And you see, friends, you will remember if you listen to Rudyard Kipling's poem, East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. The Afghan is the East in that poem. And the Afghan is noble, but a savage, uh, a forever sav savage. And what Kipling is saying, look, you can never uh, tame this savage. This savage will be the savage forever. That myth continues today. That myth continues today that some of our Afghans are barbaric people. I think that's a very unfortunate racist attitude toward the Afghan people. The second myth that the British put forward is Afghanistan is a graveyard of empires. That's not true. Uh, Afghanistan has been subordinated many times. In fact, before the British arrived there, uh, it was subordinated partly by the Mongols, partly by the Iranians and so on. You know, it's not like some mythical place that defeats all invaders. That's a ridiculous, equally racist idea. And also not true because in 1878, the British did defeat the Afghans. So how could it have been a graveyard of empires? What I was interested in from around the 1910s, the Afghan people open up a long history, a hundred year history of reform. You know, uh, the very uh, important figure of Mahmoud Tarzi, uh, who had been, his family had been exiled to Istanbul in the 19th century, returns to Afghanistan in 1911. He brings with him his partner, um, who uh, Asma Khayyum, ex extraordinary woman born in Damascus, Syria in 1877. They come to Kabul, they open a, a journal uh, called The Lamp of Truth. She starts a women's magazine. They begin a period of discussion about child uh, marriage, about polygamy, about various issues, girls' education, and so on. Their daughter, Suraya Tarzi, marries, marries the young prince Amanullah, who becomes king in 1919. And between Suraya Tarzi or Queen Suraya, her mother, Asma Khayun, they open the first girls' school in Kabul, and they they really push forward a huge agenda. 1923, the Afghans have a constitution which calls for the equality of all people, men and women. That constitution is rewritten in 1964. That constitution is rewritten in, in basically 1973, then 87, then eight, 1990. I mean, Afghanistan has five constitutions in the 19, 20th century um, that essentially call for the equality of men and women. This was not written in New York University by a professor. This was written by the Afghan people. They wrote their own history down here. But look at this. The uh, Soraya, Queen Soraya and King Amanullah travel in Europe in the late 1920s. She is photographed without a veil. She's photographed eating dinner with men and women. She's photographed having a hand kissed by President Gaston of France. The British imperialists take those pictures come and distribute it in Afghanistan, rile up the hardcore landlord section, the conservative mullahs and so on, and get uh, an insurgency against Amanullah. He's assassinated in, sorry, he's overthrown in 1929, goes into exile. 
This is the old collusion between the imperialists and the old feudal nasties in Afghanistan. This relationship will come back again in the 1970s when the United States government makes a deal with Buranuddin Rabani and people like that. Happy to talk about those scoundrels if you want, Jody. But we must never allow ourselves to imagine that Afghanistan is equivalent to those scoundrels like Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, Buranuddin Rabani, and earlier. We should never allow that because there is another side to Afghan history which the United States has consistently undermined, consistently. Uh, United States talks about democracy, talks about freedom, talks about women's rights and so on, but not for the Afghan people. They use the language of women's rights to bomb countries. They're actually not interested in social advancement. And that's the great delusion that continues today. People still believe that the US should have remained there to somehow advance the cause of women. Let me tell you, friends, during this 20 year period, the opposite of advancement happened. And I'm going to give you one statistic, Jody, and then I'll shut up. Here's one statistic. The Afghan electricity company uh, has uh, laid out a report earlier this year in which they said, Afghanistan's electricity company. You must wonder, why is he talking about electricity? He was just talking about women as he lost his mind. Electricity company has just said, just a few months ago, that electrification in Afghanistan is 35%. That means one in three Afghans have access to electricity. This doesn't mean they have 24 hour uh, electricity. They just have an electrical connection because there are power cuts. In Kabul, for instance, in the last year, Power was on for five, six hours of the day. So there were only one in three Afghans have an electricity connection. Bear this in mind. How are you going to advance the cause of women if you don't have electrification in the homes, my friend? How are women going to read at home? How are they going to get on the internet? How are they going to be able to use basic appliances to cut down on the drudgery of some of the domestic chores? You know, how is this going to happen? This is not going to happen without electrification. It's for good reason that Lenin in the 1919s uh, in the Soviet Union said electrification is the road to socialism. If you don't have electrification, you can't advance the goals of people. And look at this. 20 years, the United States occupied Afghanistan. And a few months ago, the electricity company says one in three Afghans have an electrical connection. Now you tell me that the US government was actually interested in liberating or emancipating women, let alone the rest of the Afghans. Certainly not, because you cannot have emancipation without, ele without electricity. Thank you. <laughs> So um, there's a few things. First of all, I want to bring up the fact that you said that they create chaos, but they also make a lot of money. So, you know, one of the, the wins here is the rich get richer. So they create great chaos and the rich get richer. And then, you know, the thing you're saying about the women, that this war has exacerbated the effects on poverty, malnutrition, poor sanitation, lack of access to healthcare, environmental de degradation on Afghan health. I mean, it, all, all of that where women are engaged in it. You know, I say, what are they hiding behind the skirts or the, the burqas of women? You know, they're, they hide their agenda. And so maybe you could talk about what that agenda is that they try to hide behind this excuse. Well, here's the interesting thing, Jody. In the last 20 years, I've read a number of Pentagon reports. I've read the SIGAR reports, which is the special uh, inspector general on Afghanistan and so on. And I've tried to understand, hey, listen, um, you know, US government, what are you doing in Afghanistan? Like, what's your game plan? I'm, I'm not sure, actually, if I'm honest with you. And, and I'm a reasonably intelligent person with access to a lot of US government documents. I've talked to a lot of US government uh, officials and so on. What are you people up to? Okay, we know now you've spent $2.26 trillion. Um, the Europeans barely spent anything, by the way, in the billions. Uh, it's the United States that spent the lion's share. People should also know that when you talk about NATO being involved, it's essentially a cover for US government expenditure. Um, the, the Europeans don't really put much money in. You know, the Germans had, I think the next highest expenditure, it was in the tens of billions of dollars. US spent 2.26 trillion. Uh, that's two thirds of Biden's 
um, infrastructure plan. Okay, that's two thirds of Biden's, and I think his infrastructure spending is over 10 years. I may be wrong, uh, but over 20 years, you spent 2.26 trillion on this war. Okay, uh, let's again come back to statistics, Jody, because I think this is important. Half of Afghanistan lives in poverty. Half. Half of the population, 38 billion people roughly, half of the population lives in poverty. Um, you should know about hunger. 14 million Afghans, one in three Afghans are food insecure. Two, ch two million children don't know where their next meal is going to come from. Um, this is on the agenda, friends. And over 20 years, I'm afraid, not one US government report uh, dealt with this issue of Afghan poverty, of Afghan hunger, not one US report. Sigur, the Special in in Inspector General on Afghanistan Reconstruction, was all bent out of shape about corruption in Afghanistan and not corruption of the Afghan people. Very important to bear in mind, corruption also of US contractors. I mean, the bulk of the money goes towards all kinds of fraudulent schemes. Uh, for instance, we know about ghost soldiers. $88 billion was spent by the United States government to train so-called 300,000 Afghan National Army. Uh, a report from, I think, three years ago showed that 42,000 of that 300,000 were ghost soldiers. They didn't exist. They simply did not exist. Well, um, some years ago, and I've written about this for a Globetrotter column, which will come out this week. Some years ago, uh, the new Afghan education minister, Asadullah Hanif uh, uh, Balki, made a statement, said, listen, during Hamid Karzai's time, they said 11 million children or in school, but he said, actually, it's only 6 million children. I remember going and asking the Afghan education ministry, how could you have a discrepancy between 11 million supposedly in school and 6 million? And I was told something hilarious. They said, we didn't actually count the children in school. We just counted the <laughs> chairs that were purchased. So yes, there are photographs you can see of empty ghost classrooms with chairs just piled up. So there were exactly 11 million, perhaps chairs in Afghanistan for children, but only 6 million children were going to school. So what happened was that in this entire period, all this money came in, it was full of fraud. A lot of people made money, the Afghan elites made money, but then US fraudulent contractors made money, military people made money, all the military companies made a lot of money. Nobody was wondering what's happening in Afghanistan. I mean, you want to know how did the Taliban sweep through the country? How did they sweep through the country? Because you know what? It's not that the Taliban won the war. It's that the West basically shot itself in the foot. If you don't improve the conditions of the people one jot, if you increase the suffering of the people, everyday basic suffering, they may turn to the Taliban and say, okay, have a chance. After all, after all, friends, let's be honest here. In the United States, this is how people vote, isn't it? Well, the Democrats had a chance. Now let's give the Republicans a chance. This is how the Afghans see this business. You know, it's not necessarily that the Taliban came everywhere, guns firing. These are brutal fellows, brutal fellows. But then so was the Mujahideen. And that's something to think about. I agree, maybe the Mujahideen were more placatable, easier to control them in a way. Taliban less able to be controlled. And we, we'll talk about that in a, in a bit, I suppose. But the fact is that, you know, you've given the people a choice between drowning and drowning. And one drowning is just taking a little longer than the other. You can't then turn around and say, as Biden did in a most offensive speech, when he said they just didn't fight for what were they, what did you want them, Mr. Biden, to fight for? Did you want them to fight for 50% poverty? Did you want them to fight for one in three Afghans hungry? I mean, what were they going to take up the gun to defend? There's nothing to defend, you know? What defend? Ashraf Ghani? Ashraf Ghani arrived at the airport in Kabul. Four cars arrived from his residence, packed with cash wrapped in saran wrap. They tried to stuff this cash into the plane when he flew first to Central Asia, then to the UAE. They tried to stuff the cash into the plane. Some of the cash didn't uh, fit, so it fell onto the runway. When the plane took off, that cash was flying around. I mean, this is the vision of the retreating um, comprador, you know, the, the Vichy government of Mr. Ashraf Ghani. Honestly, I mean, uh, if, look at the corruption. Um, his defense minister, Mohammed Zai, uh, as the plane took off, his defense minister had a tweet out there saying, this rich guy referring to Ashraf Ghani, he made so much corruption in the country. I mean, that was the level of 
of of disgust people had by the way that's ashraf ghani's own defense minister disgusted this government and then biden turns around and says well they what can we do they didn't fight for themselves i mean for god's sakes the united states lost this war a long time ago a long time ago and if it stayed 5 minutes longer it would not have made one jot of difference i'm quite fed up with such liberal commentary that said oh the us should have left in a better way should have left should have stayed longer and so on what left in a better way which evacuation has ever been easy look at vietnam you had the cia building people being lifted off there on helicopter which evacuation has been easy you know which evacuation uh, biden should have stayed longer people have lost their mind united states should have never even gone in there in the first place well thank you vijay but let's also remember that uh, the us has dropped more bombs on um afghanistan that you know in the last couple of years and it's killing you know it's killing innocent afghans the this taliban that we're dealing with right now isn't the taliban from 20 years ago which by the way nobody seems to remember offered to deliver osama bin laden and if they get got some of their needs met also and that was refused because bush wanted to go to war so you know when to leave that war was before it started because everyone you know anti-war activists knew that it was not a solution and so did um representative barbara lee who's calling for a cut in half of the pentagon which should be everyone's response to what is happening right now but you talk about the women used in its excuse for afghanistan um so right now we see the um Uyghurs being used as the, a, an excuse for China, and I wondered if you could relate the two. Um, and because here we see nothing happening for the women in Afghanistan, and and we we watched that over the last twenty years. Um, how is that? How are we watching that same excuse and any other uh, similarities to why we go into Afghanistan and why we're we're this aggression on China gets sold in the same way? Well first I want to just mention you said the bombs being dropped you'll remember in 2017 um when Donald Trump was the president of the United States um they dropped this enormous bomb on uh, Nargahar uh, and you know we don't know how many people died they closed the area off journalists were not permitted a colleague of mine drove from Kabul drove as fast as he could he was not permitted to enter the area we don't know what the civilian casualties were this was the so called mother of all bombs you you may remember that the cbu 43 um with the payload as as great as a nuclear bomb uh, no word about that i mean god you know talk about freedom of the press uh, where where was their freedom of the press at that time now you see for, let's before we get to eagles let's talk about the kurds I mean I would caution any movement not to make an alliance with the United States. I mean I think one of the strategic errors made by the Kurdish organizations in northern Syria was to rely on the United States because when push comes to shove the United States shoves off. I mean that's the basic point. Um Vice President Kamala Harris is sitting in Singapore. Uh, she made a statement saying the United States always stands with its allies. Well, not really because its plane took off and there were young people holding on to the wheels. including one i think a football star who fell down to their deaths i don't think people looking at that think oh the united states always stands with their allies ask the kurds really um i, I don't didn't think the kurds made a good agreement with the us to allow us air power to help them out um you know in the fight against isis because the us then just said uh, sayonara to them you know when it when it was not any more strategically viable for us interests uh this is the same sort of business that you see all over the place so look i have met uh some of these uyghur fighters uh who are in the east turkmenistan group in the borders between turkey and syria uh many of their headquarters actually are not in either uh, afghanistan or in china their headquarters are in idlib in syria the enclave where the various jihadi groups are hold up there's an agreement now between the turks and the syrians not for the syrian army to enter idlib So their headquarters are in Idlib. Their leader lives in Idlib. Uh, these are some pretty hardcore jihadis. You know, these are not like uh, democratic figures. Um, and so it, it's really interesting that the U.S. government last year, in the last days of Donald Trump, under Mike Pompeo being Secretary of State, decided to remove their organization from the terrorism list. Uh, it's really convenient. You're hotting up. 
uh, uh, you know, a kind of cold war with China. And then you decide that the one major group that the Chinese consider a terrorist group is no longer a terrorist group, even though they were on the US government list of terrorist groups. Uh, these are pretty hardcore fellows. They're not ordinary and they've conducted many attacks inside, um, inside Xinjiang and inside other parts of China. Um, and so uh, I think they are quite happy, again, to weaponize themselves for the interests of the US government. If tomorrow the US government provides them with a transport ship, uh, you know, aircraft that flies them, uh, I don't know, into some black site in Tajikistan or into Northern Afghanistan, they'll be quite prepared to take that transport and then try to enter China and create mayhem. It's clear, uh, Jody, that in the meeting between Mullah Baradar, who's now probably, let's consider him the leader of the Taliban, even though he's not, he's just the, uh, the kind of international spokesperson and so on. The titular leader is not really a leader. He's the guy who ran the courts. It's really Mullah Baradar who's calling the shots. Uh, Baradar, you know, you said it, the Taliban now are not what they were 20 years ago. Mullah Umar, who was one of the founders of the Taliban with Mullah Baradar, essentially didn't leave the narrow confines of, of Kandahar and Jalalabad, you know, in southern Afghanistan. Whereas because of the U.S. attack in uh, October 2001, you know, Baradar put Mullah Umar on his motorcycle and physically drove him across the border to Pakistan. Uh, he was Umar's transport at the time. Baradar has lived overseas for a very long time. He spent 10 years in Doha, Qatar. I visited the Taliban's office in the souk in Doha. It's fascinating. You know, they're sitting at the desk. They look like a diplomatic office. Um, he's been to Moscow. He's been around the Arab world. He's been to China. So he's got an international perspective, which they didn't have in, in 1996. He's still a hardcore jihadi. Don't get me wrong. They still have a hardcore opinion about women. They are not moderate by any count, but they are slightly practical. On the 28th of July, he had a day long meeting with China's foreign minister, uh, Wang Yi in Tianjin. And we don't know what they agreed to, but it's quite clear that there were at least two things on the agenda or maybe three. The first thing was that I think uh, the Taliban have given the Chinese an undertaking not to allow the East Turkmenistan group to set up inside Afghanistan. There's a problem. Actually, the Afghan-China border is just 91 kilometers long and it's at the end of a, of a kind of enclave, a very narrow strip of mainly kind of natural reserve and the road is very poor there. To get from Afghanistan into China, you have to go into Tajikistan. And the Tajik government has made it very clear. In fact, there was a meeting in July in Dushanbe, the capital of Tajikistan, there was a meeting to say, we are not going to permit any cross-border incursions. We're going to block our border. Um, you know, they held the meeting of the uh, Afghan contact group of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So the point I'm trying to make is that one of the things that I think Baradar, Taliban head and Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi agreed to is that in uh, Afghanistan, they will try not to have to give uh, the East Turkmenistan group haven. Secondly, the Chinese are interested in Afghanistan for the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, that's important. And I think they probably gave an undertaking to the Afghans. Look, we'll build your electricity grid, but you can't be bombing our facilities. Uh, you've got to let us, us build. So I'm not even sure, friends, what this is going to mean. These are early days. But the really interesting and important thing is in 1996, Pakistan was basically running the Taliban by remote control. Today, uh, 24, 25 years later, uh, the Pakistanis and the Chinese have a very tight relationship, a very close relationship. And Imran Khan has based, the Prime Minister of Pakistan has basically made it clear that they will uh, coordinate with China regarding Afghanistan policy. You know, just I think in June, there was an attack at a bus uh, in, in Pakistan, northern Pakistan, which was to a Belt and Road facility where Chinese workers and Pakistani workers were killed. This was conducted by one of the terrorist groups and both China and Pakistan have been upset by this. So I have a feeling that this, uh, the question of weaponizing the Uyghurs is not going to work from this sector. I think the United States will do all kinds of ideological campaigns talking about genocide and so on you know, with these right wing people from the Jamestown Institute and so on as the spokespeople for this, I think that will continue. 
and you know if people have genuine concerns about the Uyghurs and so on, they should take them up. They should go and investigate them and so on. But I have a feeling that neither Tajikistan nor Afghanistan now, given the conjuncture, and nor Pakistan is going to allow this to become a big issue, particularly given the fact that the U.S. government has blocked access for Afghanistan of its $9.5 billion of its external international reserves, which are sitting in, in the New York Federal Reserve. You know, on day two of the Taliban entering Kabul, Taliban officials went to the Central Bank of Afghanistan and said, where's our reserves? And the officials said they're sitting in New York. The Taliban was horrified. So um, the Belt and Road Initiative, the Belt and Road Initiative that you just talked about. Um, isn't Afghanistan uh, pivotal in that in some instances? And um, have, have they, has China been talking to the Taliban for longer than just this meeting? Because the US has been you know, in meetings with them for a year and a half. So I'm just wondering, is this new? Is this fresh? Or is this a long-term relationship that they feel strong about? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> wait, um, wait um, Madison, can you unmute VJ? Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so um, there's, there's two perspectives to take on this. One is a longer term, one is a shorter term. Um, in the, the spring before 9-11, in other words, I forget exactly if it was June or July of 2001, the Chinese uh, had a meeting uh, where they set up a body called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Um, it was uh, most of the Central Asian countries with observers from other countries. Um, now, by now, India, Iran, Pakistan are all members of the SCO. It's a very important regional body. It was set up in 2001 with the express purpose of the regional players, neighbors of Afghanistan, having a table to discuss the destabilizing, destabilizing influence of the Taliban. Because after all, it wasn't just, you know, the, the Chinese at the time were not worried about Xinjiang so much. It wasn't an issue yet. But the Uzbeks were very worried about the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. Uh, there were groups like this, jihad, hardcore jihadi groups, you know, which, which, you know, many of them are children of the CIA. And if we want, we can have a talk about that later. Uh, I've written about that in Washington Bullets and in uh, Dhaka Nations and so on. It, this is a serious problem for the world. Um, you know, why is it that in Dagestan, Chechnya, all these groups came up at the time they did? Anyway, um, the point is that this was formed in 2001. And, you know, Jody, you're right. When 9-11 happened, the SCO also approached the United States and said, we would like to be involved. And Bush's administration said nothing doing. Neither are we going to negotiate with the Taliban, nor do we need you. We just need you to stand with us when we start our military campaign. And all of them did. I mean, Central Asian countries did, Iran did, Pakistan did, India did, China did. Everybody said, go ahead uh, in 2001. Uh, because the US basically could have used their diplomatic and regional kind of pressure that they could have placed. And Besides, as you said, the Taliban said, we will hand over bin Laden, but to a neutral country. And first, you have to give us a docket. You have to give us, in a sense, a file on his responsibility for 9-11. U.S. said, nothing doing, we are coming. Um, you know, uh, we don't need to give you any evidence or anything. Anyway, uh, the point is that, one, the SCO has been in existence since 2001, since beginning, before this war begins. And they have had a certain contact off and on with the Taliban. Um, several years ago, they created the uh, Afghanistan Contact Group, which was a group of SCO countries inside the SCO, uh, which met to discuss the Afghanistan file. And, and I'm absolutely convinced from the conversations I have had with diplomats from India in particular, but also Pakistan, that the SCO's Syria Contact Group has been, uh, sorry, Afghanistan Contact Group has been in touch with the Taliban for years. Uh, they were restarted in 2017. They'd gone dormant for a few years. In 2017, they restarted. And I'm, again, almost 100% certain that the government of Tajikistan had opened a door to talk to the Taliban because they knew um, by then more than half the provinces in Afghanistan were under Taliban control. 
they knew you got to deal with the taliban and i think this conversation has been happening now side note this conversation has never ended between pakistani intelligence and the taliban they have been in touch forever why because the taliban every winter returned to pakistan you know they fought in the summer and returned to uh, pakistan into peshawar and waziristan and so on in the winter how do we know that because the political parties in pakistan like the ptm led by mohsin dawar and ali wazir ali wazir now in prison have complained about this for years you see because they say look these fellows come across the border and they bring their guns with them and so on they intimidate people here we are not allowed to be armed uh, technically pakistanis are not allowed to have arms although everybody does um, in in that region particularly in the northwest frontier uh, so mohsin dawar just 3 4 weeks ago had a mass rally in waziristan complaining about pakistani influence over the taliban and allowing them back and forth so that door is also open and finally in recent times it's very clear that the chinese from doha from the doha period in the last decade or so chinese have been talking to the taliban in doha this is very clear nobody denies this um they have opened the conversation because they in the last decade have been very worried about the use of uh, afghan soil and tajikistan soil uh, to germinate terrorist groups that have been attacking inside china um and so they have opened this conversation because they realize that it's not the taliban that's attacking china it's not the taliban it's these other groups so they just want an undertaking from the taliban not to attack them now will the chinese put pressure on the taliban uh, to moderate their agenda uh, i don't think so i think the chinese are going to say as long as you don't attack our territory and as long as you don't attack the belt and road you go ahead with whatever you want to i think this is a pity Uh, but i do think that the regional countries are going to put some pressure on the taliban and particularly and i want to say i don't want to sound uh, either naive or glib about this but i think the fact that china and some other powers including india in india is playing a good role here i must say even though the government of india is despicable um, the external affairs minister has played a very good role if they are able to convince Hamid Karzai, Abdullah Abdullah, and so on, to enter a national government with the Taliban, uh, at least there will be some space in the new government uh, to articulate a different agenda. You know, the road forward is not going to be some dramatic left agenda. The road forward has to be to oxygenate, uh, uh, to firstly stop the war, and that's why I think it's ridiculous for people to say, "Oh, in Panjshir Valley there will be a new resistance." The war has to end. we need a peaceful road to open in afghanistan and the taliban need to have pressure on them to allow for a national government thank you that was my next question um which is this peaceful road and 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 china playing this role in it so i'm going to go back to a year ago when we started this conversation about china is not our enemy and you know really what we were talking about is that we need cooperation with china on everything so on saving the planet on saving the people on stopping the funding of more weapons and now on the rebuilding of afghanistan and you know one of the things we're calling for and right wrote um a letter uh yesterday that's going to go out to our list um that calls on the embassy to remain open and conversation diplomacy to happen and aid to continue or at least start in some instances for the people in of, of Afghanistan like so what does this road to peace look like and uh where you know the state department uses the alarm of human rights being violated by china but we know that the first casualty of war are the violation of human rights um because it creates more it creates what um is going to undermine any rights people have to just life and and being able to eat and as you said electricity so um how how do we um as peace organizations as people for peace in the united states um what do we call for and how do we continue this work um because here's you, afghanistan a, a pivot point for us in this work to stop the aggression on china what are some ways we can raise up the disaster of afghanistan and um relate it to china uh 
Uh, Madison, you have no, to no, it's okay. She, Madison got it. it, it this uh, <laughs> Zoom is funny because when I, I always automatically mute myself when I stop talking, and then it's hard to unmute in a meeting like this. Sorry about that, people. Um, the first thing I would say is that, well, I, I am very much uh, hopeful, and I mean, not hopeful. I very much hope, I'm not hopeful for it. I very much hope that uh, some kind of national government can be created. Uh, I really hope that the, the, um, that the regional powers uh, and, and also Russia, which is not exactly a regional power, but they, they prevail uh, in Kabul. You know, the Chinese embassy, Russian embassy, Iranian embassy is open. Um, Anas Haqqani, uh, one of the members of the Haqqani family, uh, Siraj Haqqani is the vice president of the Taliban. Um, his very close kinsman uh, went to see Hamid Karzai. They spent hours together. Uh, that's a very important meeting. Uh, Karzai and Abdullah Abdullah visited the Chinese embassy. Uh, the Chinese have visited the Taliban and so on. I very much hope in these uh, discussions, there is pressure placed that a national government is essential. And, and listen, you know, Hamid Karzai and people like that, they are not some great hope of anything. Uh, Abdullah Abdullah is not a great hope of anything. But you just need to have a balanced government starting. You know, we got to have that. Uh, you, you may remember that in 2001 at the Bonn meeting and then later in the first government, uh, they decided instead of going for a true um, government, they went for a loya jirga. And you remember Malalai Joya uh, trying to, you know, enter and being treated so despicably. And then she came on tour and said, these are a bunch of warlords and so on. She was very strong at that time. You know, if only people like that had come into government earlier, in the earlier period, you know, led a process, genuine process in the country, it was not available. So we're stuck now. We're stuck with people like Karzai and Abdul. We just need a non-Taliban section in the government. I think that's important. I don't think US aid is necessary, frankly. Um, the United States needs to unblock Taliban's international reserve, or sorry, Afghanistan's international reserve. The Taliban have asked for it. US government has said no. US Treasury Department, in fact, has told the IMF to block IMF disbursements of cash. All of this stuff I'm talking about is going to be in my Globe Trotter column this week. So if you want all the details, it will be there. You'll get it in the usual places. It, it goes through the whole thing. It has the IMF spokesperson's response and so on. The US has cut off Afghanistan from cash. Uh, this is, you know, why would you do that? Uh, you know, th this is not the time to play that game, especially given the fact that you've uh, got, you know, thousands of people you need to evacuate and you, you are insisting on the 31st August deadline. Taliban has said, we are not extending your deadline. Why are you trying to strong arm them before you've got your nationals and those who have collaborated with you out of the country? It's illogical. So the question, Jody, isn't US aid. I mean, the Afghans have 9.5 billion in US banks, which is their own money, which is just sitting there. Plus they have 360 million coming to them immediately from the IMF. Uh, the congressmen, Democrats and Republicans have put a bill in the US Congress saying block all money to the Afghanistan government. I mean, you can't now say let's put aid. Let them first have their own money. Why you, you know, forget aid. And secondly, it is a ridiculous thing that the US government closed the embassy. I mean, what were they afraid of? Iran 1980? I mean, is that really, they were worried about Iran redux? Uh, you know, that's crazy. I mean, all the other governments, in, except India and US, both India and US took the embassies out. Um, the others are still there. You need people, you need diplomats there. So the US pulled out its embassy and then sent its CIA chief to go and talk to the Taliban. You see that the CIA chief was there yesterday and I think today as well. Uh, William Burns, I believe he is. He was there talking to the Taliban. So he flew into the country to meet with them to discuss the evacuation and so on. So friends, I mean, the issue is, you know, first, uh, we should make sure that there's a national government, which was, by the way, the plan of the last left wing president of Afghanistan, Mohammad Najibullah, who was assassinated by the Taliban in 1996. They dragged him out of the UN compound and they hung him from a lamppost outside the compound and allowed people to photograph his body. Mohammad Najibullah was the last real president of Afghanistan. He spent his last few years calling for a government of reconciliation, of unity. 
the mujahideen rejected it completely you know they they were not interested they were in the middle of a civil war we need a government of reconciliation that's number one secondly the government needs to have the money come in it's their money you know I, i'm opposed in principle to blocking a country's money like that i oppose it in principle even if i don't like the government i don't know if that's the best way using this kind of hybrid war technique is not the best way you just lost a war now you want to enter a hybrid war destabilize the country even more create even more starvation and i must say i'm pretty horrified that the un hasn't called upon the us to release those funds you know I, i'm pretty like every day i get frustrated with the un you know un workers are pretty disheartened they've put their hearts and souls uh, unicef workers have put their hearts and souls uh, to bring some level of education and progress into society um you know they just have not been assisted by the united states occupation and now the money cut off i mean what what's the road ahead you know if you're a us citizen you, at this point you must uh, you know fight against this use of financial warfare against countries you know uh, go and read about the friends in defense of the un charter 18 countries that have created a grouping at the un including venezuela china and so on um you know uh, what they are going to do to afghanistan now it's unconscionable you know this great hunger problems how will the whatever government comes to kabul how will they pay their bills to import food um you know they import 70% of the electricity 70% of the electricity is imported and i just told you only one in three people have electric connection they will not get electricity you know you talk about you you consider the afghans barbaric it's you who's making them barbaric Thank you, BJ. So, I, what we are asking for our, with Anne's letter um, tomorrow is not the U.S. aid, but that the U.S. fund the UNHCR three hundred and fifty million dollars for basic aid, because BJ, you have a lot more optimism than I think we do at Code Pink, because we have been trying to stop sanctions on many countries for the life of Code Pink. Um, so yes, we would like that to happen. We don't. We're not. We feel like we have a better chance of asking for three hundred and fifty million dollars in aid right now, and to keep the embassy open. Because yes, there are hybrid wars going on in many countries, um, and they're you know we're the United States government is strangling other countries, and and they they are violating human rights across the, the planet. And so um, I think for Anne and Medina and myself, where we're trying to stop sanctions every day, it became uh, let you know three hundred and fifty million dollars is the basic cost of the war on Afghanistan a day for all these years. So you know, just one day of the war could we feed the people? And so that's what the ask is. And I think Madison or others have been putting it in the chat if people want to sign on to that. But I agree with you. We need to be in diplomacy. We need to be in cooperation. And this brings us back to China. So here we are, watching the failure of the United States imperialism over again. And yet we have these two bills going through Congress right now. Um, two bills that say, you know, fund. Aggression on China, and so what's another? You know, what do we say in the face of that to our members of Congress? Um, yeah, it's yes, we want to help Afghanistan, but we also want to stop this aggression on China. I mean, when, 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 when? How many wars? Uh, you know how many wars you know how much brutality does the united states need to inflict on the planet you know uh i i just i don't know what the tipping point is you know at what point do people say look i just can't the old slogan not in my name you know i just can't tolerate this uh particularly given defeat by a country of roughly 38 million afghanistan a country of 23 million iraq and then you know i don't even know what the population of libya is any longer you know a country with great attrition of population um, not only from death but people being displaced around the world and so on these three places you haven't been able to attain your war ends do you think you will truly be able to decimate the chinese 1.4 billion uh, you know with the military capacity to at least defend itself 
um, with cities all around the countryside, with a, a population with a high level of patriotism, uh, with high level of literacy, high level of, of mobilization to defend itself. We saw that in the pandemic. You know, when 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 a local authority says, "Hey, listen, we we have to lock down," they lock down. You know, uh, th there is no chaos in 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 China. Uh, it's a highly ordered and organized society. People have faith in their government and so on. You think it's going to be easy to quote unquote defeat the Chinese? This is an entirely illusionary situation. Um, secondly, the Chinese are not going to go the way of the Soviet Union. There are no Gorbachevs in their in their leadership. You know, nobody is going to commit harakiri of the Chinese. It's not going to happen, friends. It's just not going to happen. It, um, there was that Harvard University study of faith in, in, the, in the government. It's much higher there than anywhere in the world, not because of repression, but because the government fulfills certain objectives. It abolishes absolute poverty, whatever. Like any government, it has lots of problems. I mean, it's a country of 1.4 billion. You can't tell me that it's perfect, okay? It's not perfect. I've traveled to China many times. A lot of problems there. You know, many problems, uh, like any other place, because the Chinese are not from another planet. They are like humans. Um, and the leadership is human and they make errors and they try their best to learn from them and they try their best to come out in public and say we made mistakes on this, that and the other thing. In fact, I'm very interested in the 1950s, the Chinese first set up the Minorities Commission, you know, in the 1950s. In fact, Dalai Lama was the chairperson of the National Minorities Commission in Beijing in the 50s. But the Chinese from the 50s really didn't advance the goal of minorities very well. You know, they tried to do it first in a kind of culture way. It's only in the last 10 years that in this poverty alleviation, abolition of absolute poverty, that the, the goals of the minorities have advanced, you know, because it was true 10 years ago, Chinese government admitted that most of the absolute poverty was among minorities. You know, the, the Miao people, the Tibetans, the Uyghurs and so on. A lot of this poverty alleviation has been around minorities. That was a big error. So many years you haven't dealt with that. But then they recognized it, looked it in the eye, said, let's settle this. So, I mean, I, I just think it's, it's quite ridiculous for people to have this, you know, hyperventilation that the United States military is going to go and save the Chinese people from a government that they have faith in. Come on, guys. I mean... Uh, this is insane because in the United States, faith in the government is virtually zero. And I'm not talking about all of you guys having no faith in the government. I mean, knock on your neighbor's door and ask them how much faith they have in the government. They won't listen to the government and wear a mask. They won't listen to the government and get vaccinated. There's no faith in the government. So a country where the people have no faith in the government is going to go and conduct a war against a country where people have faith in the government strikes me as nutty, you know. The government that you have faith in is supposed to be oppressing you. Look, I know people have all kinds of worries about freedom of speech and religion and the Uyghurs and so on. Um, I'm sure there's lots of problems in China. You know, as I said, it's a, it's a society of humans. There will be problems. But are you seriously proposing that because you have identified this or that problem, that your warships on the coastline of China are going to change the situation? You've lost your mind. I mean, you can't uh, build a nation in, in, in Afghanistan. What are you going to do in China? Have you lost your mind? I'm not even contesting people's interpretation of this or that problem in China. I, I don't even contest it. But this is not the way. You know, if you believe there's some oppression happening to the Uyghurs, you really think that the US bombing of a city in China is going to change the attitude of the government? What's your strategy? I mean, the United States government seems never to have a, a long term strategy. You know, you can bomb any country and destroy it. I know that you've demonstrated it over and over again. But what's the end game? The end game is the whole world hates you. That's the end game. The whole world hates you. That's the end game. Thank you, Vijay, for always telling the truth and inspiring us uh, to continue to do our work. Yes, you know, the next step is to cut the Pentagon in half as just the first step of ending this madness. So we will continue that from tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Um, so many people have asked um, where they can follow you. So uh, um, Madison has been posting in the chat, but everyone should be subscribed to the Tri-Continental Institute. He just said he's got one coming out tomorrow, did you say? Yeah, this will come out from Globetrotter, which is a syndication service that gets published in like Counterpunch, People's Dispatch. Uh, the same article will be carried in about 100 places. So I recommend 
if you read these publications you're doing great um look at people's dispatch every day by the way guys it's one of the best uh, news sources for around the world yes agree with that so um Another thing is, is you can go to uh, Code Pink. We have a resource page on Afghanistan and we'll, we'll make sure to put those links in there for you. But we need to continue to learn, to share, to inspire others and um, to be deliverers of the truth in the midst of the madness and calling on the end of it. So thank you, Vijay, for inspiring all these people here. And thank you so many of you for showing up, for being passionate, for being engaged. Um, we thank you deeply and onward to peace. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, BJ. Bye. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care of yourselves and don't forget to get vaccinated and masked and so on. You're wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, BJ. Thank you. Bye, BJ. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, BJ. <laughs> Thank, Hi, you Jody, so I Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. 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 Thank you, Jody.